you know, with the lack of fiscal autonomy, there will be lack of adequate financial resources, and with the lack of adequate financial resources, um, there is a gap in development because these units of government cannot access financing that is critical to financing development. Now, just to provide the highlights of the local government structure in Nigeria, like I stated earlier, there are three levels of government, the federal, the state, and the local government. Now, the local government is designed constitutionally as an independent unit of government, and there are currently 774 units, local government units, which are recognized in Nigeria. Now, unfortunately, the power to create the local government and the make laws for the financing of the co local government lies in the state government. As a matter of fact, Section 7 of the Constitution acknowledges the local government structure. Section 7 of the 1999 Constitution acknowledges the local government structure, but only states that the local government can only be created by the states, and in creating the states, in, in creating the local government by the states, only the state has the power to be able to design the goals, the agenda, and the financing for the local government. Now, in light of the way the constitution is designed, like I stated earlier, the financing power of the local government is divided and limited to two main sources. Now, the constitution also in section 7 states that for public revenue, for the public revenue reasons, um, allocations have been made by the federal and the state governments um, to these local governments, and um, the local government has the power to, which I will explain in the course of this presentation, the local government has the power to raise taxes um, on certain issues that have been identified specifically by the constitution and it limits the scope of what the local government can raise resources on. Now, in relation to the first main source of local government financing in Nigeria, which is the statutory allocation to be made to the local government by the other units of government, which are the federal and state governments, the constitution provides that the federal and state governments make up for statutory allocation um, to the local government. Now, the allocations that have been made by the federal government from the federation account, there's to be established the federation account under section um, 162 of the constitution. Now, the allocations that have to be made by the federal government um, to the local government can only be paid to the local government through the state's government. So, which means, although there is a federation account through which the federal government makes allocation of resources to the federal government, to ministries and um, development agencies in the state and as well as state governments in the country. When the local government is uh, making resources available to the local government, those resources are paid directly not to the local governments uh, which are recognized by the constitution and are recognized as an autonomous and independent unit by the constitution, but they are made to the state governments. Now, there are local governments in each state. So as opposed to making this payment directly to the local government, payments are made directly to the state governments who will now disburse these resources to the state government. Now, the allocations and proper dis disbursements of these funds are often, are often you know, mismanaged by states, they are often politicized, and this tends to affect development. Now, what do I mean by this? Um, you know, because both units are independent, imagine a state with 20 local governments, and at the state level, a particular, a particular political party is in power, and a different, this is just even the basic reference that has even been recognized by the president. Um, President Ronald Obama very recent times where he um, where he criticized the way the um, local government structures the local governments are currently structured. So imagine um, Party A in power at the state government level, and the, the constitution has recognized that the state government is to make resources available um, to the local government. Imagine a local government um, with a different political party that um, is another head of the state government with a different political party. Now. These are the kind, these are the realities of local government structures across the federation in Nigeria. And due to um, mismanagement of resources at the state government level, these resources tend to either be delayed or sometimes do not even get to the local government. And yet the constitution still recognizes the local government as an independent unit that ought to achieve the development agenda of the states and of the federal government. Now with this structure in mind, um, um, it is clear that this structure can be better designed better fiscal autonomy and for ensuring that local governments can also drive development within the areas that they have been constituted. Now, um, to the next source of, local, uh, of uh, revenue for public revenue for the local government, uh, we have internal generated revenue. Um, paragraph 1B, I'll just read this out. Um, paragraph 1B of, the shed, of Schedule 4 of the 1999 Constitution lists the following as among the functions of the local government. Now, collection of rates, 
radios and television licenses, imposition of radio and television licenses, licensing of bicycles, trucks, other than mechanically propelled trucks, and canoes, wind barrels and carts, assessments of privately owned houses or tenements, for the purpose of living such ways as may be prescribed by the House of Assembly of the State, among others. Now, the Constitution recognizes that the local governments of the state, that the local governments within the states can, you know, raise revenue and raise um, financing basically from these sources. Now, the two problems with this, as currently constituted, that the Constitution does not give the local governments in any way. Bearing in mind that um, taxes can only be raised as designed by laws, and we'll get to how this has impacted local governments in recent times. Taxes can only be, tax basically is the creation of the law, right? And then the Constitution says if the local government can raise revenue from these sources, then because financing is critical to the local government, then it ought to make, it ought to make um, it's possible for the, for the local governments to be able to raise financing on these sources as currently defined in the Constitution. But the problem is that for the local government to be able to effectively raise resources or raise financing on these sources, the House of Assembly has to further make a law. So in the absence of a law on these sources that have been defined by the Constitution, um, the, federal, the local governments would find it difficult to raise resources and when the, when the um, House of Assembly of the state, which is the legislative arm of the state, is yet to make a law, yet to design laws, as is currently the case in certain states in Nigeria, um, the local government would lack the ability to be able to raise financing of these sources. Now, in addition to the limitations I've just identified from the Constitution, um, Section 315 of the 1999 Constitution similarly states that the taxes and approved, the taxes and levies approved list of collection between 1988, which was made um, during the time of the military government, which is now an act for the National Assembly, is still valid and it prescribes the following as taxes levies to be collected by the local government. Shops and kiosks rates, um, tenement rates, slaughter lab fees, motorpark levies, radio and television license fees, customer grants permits, among others. Now, for the purpose of financing and for the purpose of recognizing the local government as an independent unit, um, based on the existing literature, and I mean general common sense, it, it would make more sense or it would be better for you know, fiscal policy design for um, the local governments to be able to make bylaws or to be able to um, lend their voices to, based on the realities, the economic realities within the local governments, to issues and to other sources of revenues um, that the local governments will be able to raise financing on. Because as currently designed, um, these revenue sources are limiting, these revenue sources are limited and the scope is generally limited and it affects the financing um, that the local government generally can raise from uh, from the local government units as, as currently designed <coughs> excuse me, in the states. Um, so the problem with the constitutional design of idea of states is that the scope of what the local government can raise financing on is often limiting because they like the constitutional powers to make laws for this purpose and as such powers are invested in the state's government and like I said earlier, the scope of all they can raise financing on is generally limited. It's too little. Um, local governments cannot effectively raise proper financing from issues such as shops and kiosk rates, um, slaughter lab fees, motor park levies, and you know, developments cannot happen when these um, the rates are this little. And what they can do basically is very limiting. And in light of the challenges that um, the local governments have faced in the past due to the limited scope of what they can raise resources on and um, the lack of fiscal autonomy having to rely on the state and federal government for um, revenue allocations in the past, um, certain states in the Federation I and mean, across the Federation have sought at different times to, you know, through bylaws or by expanding the scope of what the Constitution provides that they can um, raise internal generated revenues on, they've sought to you know, try to expand the scope and you know, required to raise more revenues. But again, because of the limited scope and because of the deficiencies in the design, um, these are always the challenge. One of such cases is the Shell Petroleum Development Company of Nigeria and the Bureau to Local Government Development Council in, um, in 1989. The Local Government Development Council sought to you know, increase its revenues by um, imposing certain taxes on Shell, the, the globally renowned um, oil and gas company. Um, so the local government in question sought to increase the revenues um, that it could raise from this particular 
um, this particular company operating within its area and he sought to raise um, and there are other cases like this um, there are cases from even the Lagos State Government which is the economic hub of Nigeria seeking to raise revenue through issues such as advertising and things that the local government thought you know since these resources are within its purview, there is a gap between what the federal government and state governments can raise on these revenue sources and it sought to expand what they could tax and what they could collect levies on. And in all of these cases, the courts in Nigeria repeatedly struck down um, the attempts by the local government because of how the constitution is designed to raise revenues outside the scope of what the constitution currently permits. And bear in mind that this is limiting um, this like I've stated repeatedly, affects developments because um, proper financing of the local governments definitely would affect proper um, implementation of development agendas, even at the grassroots level of governments. Now, what are the policy implications of you know ensuring proper financing of the local governments, like of the limitations you know, that I've identified in in um, the preceding slides? Um, yeah, with proper and effective financing of the local governments in Nigeria, um, this would have the potential to you know, improve development at the grassroots. Um, it lends itself to raising that when there's proper financing, the local governments can engage in more development agendas. And this would also encourage political participation across levels of government because local governments will be more active than they are today because local governments are not as active as they ought to be. Um, this would also reduce on reliance of the local governments on the state for revenue. And as the saying goes, he will place the pipe and he place the tune. So the local government, in light of, a, in light of the political structures that are currently that are in place within the states, the local governments can only do so much as um, the state's sanctions or the state's permits it to do. And in light of the fact that it relies on the state government for revenue, so the local government cannot in any way bear in mind that it's supposed to be an independent and autonomous unit of government um, disagree or you know engage in policy conversations with the states that. It would that would otherwise be in its best interest where the state does not sanction you know, these um, policy agendas. And generally, in light of the fact that um, currently in Nigeria, tax to GDP ratio is currently at 6%, and there's just been the drive at the federal and state government levels to improve you know, public revenues across the nation. Where the local governments were, if the local governments were allowed to participate effectively um, in and local governments are allowed to participate effectively in you know, this revenue drive that is currently being run by federal and state government levels. This will generally improve public revenues you know, across the nation as they will be able to keep that to themselves and you know, there will be independence, there will be true independence and true fiscal federalism in the way that resources are managed across the three levels of government. Now, um, in policy conversations about improving revenues in, in, in Nigeria, the elephant in the room always is corruption. Right, because um, corruption continue, continue, continues to, you know, affect how public revenues are, are spent. So even if these revenues are increased, big question is how are they going to be managed? Um, now this part was not included in the slides, but the Nigeria Financial Intelligence Unit. Um, One minute left, Daniel. Okay. You have to round up. One okay, thank you very much. Um, the Nigeria Financial Intelligence Unit has. You know, been releasing circulars which has been sanctioned by the courts um, when the states have sought to challenge these um, circulars in the past on how, in light of fiscal federalism, how um, resources can be spent across the states and where, the, where these recommendations are to be made to the um, way that revenue will be generated by the local government and spent by the local government. Um, it would be expected that um, this should help to curb the impact of corruption on spending of public resources generally and thank you very much for listening thank you thank you Daniel. thank you who else is online daniel you stick around when we get to questions time surely there will be some questions for you all right thank you thank you sir we have uh, another Daniel Osubali. Is it online? Is Daniel Osubali online? I don't see him online. So we will move to the presentation by Khalil. Khalil, as well, is not online. 
Yes, I think our next two presenters are not available for now. And we, we definitely have to use the time for discussion because we had three great presentations for which I thank you, colleagues. Uh, that's, I like all the presentations that were very informative and <coughs> thought-provoking about the issues raised. And I would like to start, before I open, I won't try, I will not try, I will make sure that I don't start giving new presentations in their presentations. No, I will not do that. So even if it's in one or two lines, I can simply capture what, uh, what I picked up and perhaps note a, a question. And then after that, I will invite uh, all our colleagues on the floor to ask questions. If you have questions uh, to ask, please just try to be like me. Let's not make new presentations in the presentation. That enable us to engage, to hear various views. So I will try, not try again. I will simply pick up one or two issues uh, that I picked up from the presentations. Uh, starting with Obrian, thank you. Thank you for putting the case, uh, the debt situation in Zambia, but importantly, the constitutionalism attached to it. Because for me, you capture the notion of separation of power at play in financial oversight in Zambia. And Interestingly, in your concluding remarks, you were not so sure whether the judiciary can really help. And I will ask you, uh, in my view, what could be then the solution if, in the case of failure of separation of power, not only, uh, and more importantly, the judiciary, what can be done to ensure that there is financial oversight now and i think to takunda and panache great presentations as, as well uh, what i like what I, I like about your presentation i like because you had very limited time but you could do you could capture the three perspectives so well that it was uh, I would say very easy to understand the differences uh, on how uh, FDI uh, are addressed in these countries when you look at monism versus dualism and how it appears. And my question is why would South Africa be then so attractive in a context like that? And my other question is definitely is foreign direct investment for who? Why? To what extent Africa really needs foreign direct investment? In the discourse of foreign direct investment, we are all our countries, we keep thinking uh, we must release the condition to have foreign investors. Does it go down to the people or the beneficiaries? To what extent can we really say so, given the amount of illicit financial flows that goes with it. When you see how many companies, foreign companies will invest, and for some Chinese companies, they bring every, everybody working in the firm from China. Even the dog is not a local dog. The dog that run around the place is <laughs> brought on the plane. So, to what extent that foreign, foreign direct investment is important? If so, that's a question to capture. Now, <coughs> uh, to Daniel Ulika, thank you, thank you for presenting 
the challenges uh, face uh, financial or financing challenges faced by the local government in, in Nigeria when they have to raise money yet they don't have the teeth to do so and this brings the question uh, what could be the type of constitutional amendment that can be made in Nigeria to ensure a better empowerment of local government. And again, you were saying the elephant in the room is corruption. And to what extent the local government officers or representatives will also not be captured by corruption? If there were a constitutional amendment, to what extent uh, we will be able to witness a difference? So this is perhaps my brief uh, summary or uh, reading or understanding of your papers. Perhaps uh, as you take note the few questions that I was asking, and uh, not to perhaps some of my questions are tough. No, it's not to discard the quality of the paper, but to create the engagement so that we hear various perspectives on those discourses. So I will be circulating. How many hands do we have? One, two, three. OK, then we start with the three first plus the two questions, the, the question then we can go back to, to, to the presenters. Daniel, please stay, you have, please stay online and try to get your questions. Thank you. I was not said, thank you very much. One, two, three. Okay, I'll start. <laughs> thank you, Prof. Um, thank you for all the presenters for really interesting uh, uh, presentations. Uh, my question is to Takunda. Um, and again, I agree with Prof that I think you, you covered from a, a comparative perspective the three different countries really well. Um, and it helps just to kind of get a, a better sense of the differences and the difficulties that each country might face with FDI. Um, my question will sort of zoom in on South Africa specifically, and I think we've had this conversation already. Um, and, I, and I think it goes back to when South Africa started cancelling their BITs in 2009, um, and then later uh, started the conversation in Parliament about the Protection of Investment Act bill, and then finally became an act, and I think it only commenced in 2018. Um, and so I think there is protection for investors, but there is this question around the balancing of competing interests, right? So on the one hand, you have investors who want their investments to be protected, but on the other hand, you have governments saying that we want to be able to protect our own people. And so we want to be able to tell investors, if you're going to invest, these are the infrastructural things that you need to be doing. Um, they also consider uh, how our community is affected and governments are better able to regulate uh, what is happening with investment in their own countries if they're not bound by a BIT that actually favors foreign investors over local investors um, and prioritizes foreign investors over governments. And so there is this power asymmetry and imbalance. And so I guess my question is, how do you perceive um, the competing interests between the right to regulate of a state especially in the African context, where we're wanting to regulate for ourselves and wanting to move forward as Africans on African terms versus the rights of investors as they invest in African countries. And so, yeah. Thank you. Um, my question is to O'Brien. Um, I want to... Uh, still or, or uh, known from Professor Ch Chitamira, which I was said yesterday, uh, we must uh, speak about the elephant in the room. Uh, and that is, you mentioned that uh, sometimes up to three times the money that is given for inv or is invested is uh, stolen again. So um, the, the sad thing about that is that there's only a few people that benefit from from that, that money and the, the majority of the population then have to pay it back. So um, do, you, do you think, is, is there any way that politicians are held responsible for taking the kickbacks? As you mentioned, happens there. So that's my question. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, I just want to latch on to your very important question on the separation of powers. I also find it very interesting that uh, uh, the professor mentioned. For me, it's, I would think, that there's a lack of accountability on the part of the legislature because they were supposed to obviously draft uh, legislation and so forth. Um, you also mentioned something about the role of civil society and what they can do, you know, to sort of put pressure on, on, on government. What is the role of civil society within Zambia, um, you know, in, this, in the situation where the court has failed, which I doubt, because the court adjudicates on the facts before them, and they will look last resort. It's really the responsibility of the legislature to develop laws. Um, but what is the role of civil society? Because I think that question is, is coming up very strongly in South Africa as well, you know? Where politicians are, with the, with the same faces on the executive and the same faces on the legislature, they want the same thing, so they need the cahoots. Then with regards to my young colleague, the brilliant presentation, learned a lot about uh, indirect expropriation and so forth. How do you think that we as African countries can protect ourselves? You mentioned this law that Zimbabwe has developed in 2021. Um, have they been successful um, with that law um, to ensure that we sort of move away from this international arbitration, as you mentioned, and then moving cases to sort of local courts uh, to adjudicate matters of that nature? Thanks. Thank you so much for the questions. Uh, let's start with uh, Daniel, who is online, because uh, we don't want to lose him with the, with the network issues. So Daniel, please, over to you to respond to the comments or questions. OK. <coughs> so as I understand it, um, I've been asked what are the necessary constitutional amendments that need to be made to um, uh, to improve the way the constitution designs um, financing for the local governments in Nigeria and how to address um, corruption concerns that would possibly arise um, when the financing situation is improved with regards to local governments in Nigeria. So just to address these issues, the first is that the way the constitution is currently designed and the first problem of, um, I mean, everyone who reads the constitution and sees the realities on ground and you know, even scholars have criticized this is that there's a due reliance that is placed in relation to the design of local governments and the financing of local governments um, for in relation to the in relationship between the local governments and state governments. So what do I mean by this? Before local governments can be created in Nigeria, um, the local the state government has to sanction, the state government drives the process for the creation of local governments, which is fine. But I think that the powers in relation to the local governments should stop there. Um, the, the, power, the supervisory powers of the state governments over the local government should stop there. Um, the local government should not be made to rely on the state government for financing. Um, the local government should not be made to rely on the state government for the um, creation of, for the expansion of the scope of what it can you know, exercise taxing powers over. I think that the local government should be able to create bylaws over what um, it should be able to provide, over what it should be able to tax without creating situations of double taxation. For instance, in the local, in the state, in the local state government case that I cited in the course of my presentation, I stated that advertising resources which are not effectively captured and which are not effectively taxed um, by the federal and state governments were sought to be taxed by the local government in that particular that case. And you know, the court struck down the power of the local government to be able to create bylaws over what it could tax. So, um, in, in, in creating a situation of proper fiscal federalism, the state government should be, this local government should not be made to rely on necessarily on the state government for resources. And um, the power, supervisory power of the state government over the local government should stop at you know creating new local governments within the state, and that should be it. Um, the local state, local government should not be made to rely on integration finance. I think I'm getting myself at this point, but yes, um, that is the number one constitutional amendment that ought to be made. Um, and I think that where that where this is the situation where the local government has the power to create bylaws about what it can tax, and where the local government is not required to rely on the state government for financing, then this will create an independent nature for the local government and has the potential to improve um, um, access to resources and financing for development at the local government at the grassroots level of government. So that's my response to the first question. 
and in relation to yeah, as I described it, the elephants in the room and how um, what can be done to effectively curb corruption. Now, the problem with um, corruption in Nigeria is that it's not that there are laws, it's not that um, there, there's, a lack, there's an absence of laws, it's not that the laws are not enough to be able to effectively you know, combat corruption. The problem actually is in relation to the implementation of these laws. Um, in, in the same way in every developed society, you have the arm of government that is responsible for combating corruption. In Nigeria, you have two. Um, where you have the FBI, you have the EFCC and the ICPC in Nigeria, you also have the state police, you have to also have the federal police rather, and you also have the, direct, the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution, who have all been constitutionally empowered to fight and combat corruption. But the problem with this situation is you know, proper implementation and the lack of political will. And um, lately we've seen um, organizations such as the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit um, we're trying to create laws and trying to create circulars which are which they sought to you know, use to effectively combat corruption by limiting um, statutorily what um, the local governments can do with their resources and what the state governments can do with their resources um, to be able to curb corruption by creating a treasury single account where all payments made, um, all the revenues that are being generated by these various units of government go into one particular, one particular post or one particular wallet for the federal government for you know, disbursements to be made. You know, these are all resources that are currently in place, which in my opinion, I think are fairly comprehensive, comprehensive um, but the conversation moves beyond the scope of what the law can do to one of political will and one in relation to implementation. So outside of you know, this situation, political will is not something that the law can influence because for, in my opinion, the law has done as much as it can possibly do. Um, I think it is within the domain of political will for you know, proper implementation to happen. And I would just ordinarily say maybe um, the the you know, states the state agents. Uh, in as much as South Africa is the third largest economy in Africa by GDP, some also st uh, state that it's the strongest economy in in Africa because it's very diverse. There are more services that are offered. Uh, there are more manufacturing hubs in South Africa than in any other African country. So the economic questions. Uh, please, if you have further questions or follow-up questions to the previous colleagues who spoke, uh, when we are asking questions for Khalil presentation, we can also add our follow-up questions. Uh, Khalil, please, over to you, 15 minutes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so the paper I'll be presenting today is titled Translating Transformative Constitutions to International Investment Law the case of Kenya. So broadly speaking, uh, my study is situated against the backdrop uh, of the recent wave of reforms uh, of foreign investment instruments to respond to African states' developmental and policy priorities and to mitigate the historical asymmetry um, of these instruments which have uh, been to the favor of large of investors and to the subjugation of these priorities as, uh, as one of the previous uh, speakers uh, speaking about. So I specifically focus on Kenya um, and uh, whose foreign investment uh, agreements largely made of a historical asymmetry that I've just described. Um, and specifically, my focus is on its constitution that was promulgated in 2010. Uh, and this constitution is largely considered to be transformative in nature. Uh, and my, my key investigation is what are the overriding policy and developmental priorities that such a transformative constitution demands of Kenya's uh, um, foreign investment framework. So broadly speaking, I take transformative constitution to mean a constitution that conceptualizes a comprehensive order for a more just and equal society. So basically uh, envisions social and economic transformation and further um, acts as a sort of instrument to prompt state action to realize that uh, transformation. Um, so Kenya's constitution is widely considered to be transformative and there is broadly broad evidence towards this end. For example, is the transformative principles of governance that bind all state actors such as social justice, equality, equity and sustainable development, a robust human rights regime which points towards the uh, egalitarian and democratic society that uh, it envisions, and other um, transformative provisions which take to uphold uh, positive socio-economic change such as affirmative action policies and socioeconomic rights aimed at elevating uh, the socioeconomic well-being of those who are disadvantaged. 
So clearly, um, this project of transformation is widespread. It is, you could even say, radical, um, and you could even say extends to our context since, since it's a wider social and economic transformation. So as I said earlier, Kenya's foreign investment instruments largely focus on protecting investor rights with minimal reference to state developmental objectives. So um, this dichotomy represents me one of our key research question, which is what overriding features of Kenya's project of transformation ought to be translated to its foreign investment rules, and how far have they been translated to these rules? Um, and in response to this question, I make two uh, overarching claims. So the first claim is translated to its foreign investment rules, Kenya's transformative constitution prime not only requires this to bind investors to interpret or development and positive socio-economic change as substantive foreign investment objectives, and three, preserve Kenya's right to regulate in line with the positive obligations to realize uh, constitutional transformation on the state. Um, these are the criteria that I found to be most relevant to the foreign investment context. Obviously, they're not exhaustive, also because of the scope of uh, this particular article. Um, so I apply these three criteria to various uh, to its foreign investment framework composed of its domestic legislation and foreign investment agreements that are enforced, which are about 12 in total, um, to conclude that uh, they do not meaningfully meet these transformative concerns. Um, so I'll begin by going through each of them and applying them to my findings. So as I stated earlier, the first of these concerns was to bind investors to Kenya's robust human rights regimes. So like most transformative um, constitutions, Kenya's constitution requires a culture of justification, um, a term that's consistently used in the literature, to describe uh, the fact that every exercise of power, whether by public actors or by right, the anchor within in our book of constitutional law and, and general law. Uh, and human rights are a fundamental manifestation of this. Um, they form the values upon which every every action must be anchored, um, especially because Kenya's Human Rights Bill of Rights expressly states that it applies horizontally, so to both private and public actors, that it's a basis for all economic policies, and that there is a positive obligation on the state to realize human rights in all instances. So the foreign investment context often means that investors who are often have been accused of uh, not being very concerned about uh, human, rights cons uh, human rights obligations, they must be bound by that because of this horizontality and this significance in the broader transformative scheme of Kenya's constitution. So my findings with regard to um, this first criteria is that although there are glimmers of human rights concerns in a few of Kenya's bilateral investment agreements, um, largely uh, this concern is not fulfilled. So uh, this, these glimmers uh, manifest in preambles, which sometimes recognize consumer rights, rights to health, environment, um, and labor, which I've put up in the slide, uh, examples. Um, and so they, 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 are, they, they are just purely rec recognizing, but they're not really imposing any obligations, um, especially also because investment tribunals tend to take preambles as, as the imposing of substantive investor obligations. So it's difficult to enforce human rights obligations on these investors, particularly uh, in the absence of expressed international human rights obligations in specified in these treaties, or specific instruments specified in these treaties, or even uh, reference to domestic legislation that uh, accounts for human rights in, in, in these treaties. Uh, generally, it's hard to enforce human rights obligations on investors in the absence of these three things, and Kenya's um, foreign investment agreements uh, definitely do not have any of them. So regarding the second one, the second criteria, which is sustainable development and positive socioeconomic change as substantive investment objectives. So transformation in transformative constitutions is not just a social or political transformation, but also an economic transformation. Um, some have even said economic revolution. And that entails substantive equality in terms of redistributing resources, uh, but also generally positive economic development that um, elevates 
the, well, the material well-being of citizenry because it's, it's a connection between the exercise of civil and political that you need material you need to be materially well to exercise them. And that's something that's definitely in sustainable development the of governance explicitly uh, in so my argument here is not entirely special that sustainable development should be translated to Kenya's foreign investment agreements. I'm sure previous speakers, as I've seen from the program, have already spoken about this. But sustainable development would require equitably improving material welfare, bringing standards of living and eradicating poverty. And Kenya's socioeconomic rights, uh, which are also enshrined in its constitution, for example, to food, health, water, also point towards an affirmative duty to developmental measures that alleviate poverty and promote social welfare. So uh, in, the, in, in the foreign investment context, that would mean that uh, sustainable development and positive socioeconomic change are um, criteria or they are, you could say, objectives of, of foreign investment, which has been done in some bilateral investment treaties, such as the Morocco-Nigeria bilateral investment treaty. So. Um, in Kenyan bilateral investment treaties, general references are made to development, uh, also to be found in the preamble, but not as an objective or criteria for foreign investment. So these are usually in the frame of uh, economic cooperation or something of this, and they're not integrated uh, into a substantive, substantive definition of investment or as an objective of foreign investment. Kenya's domestic legislation does say, state that foreign investment must be deemed beneficial to Kenya and provides a number of criteria such as technology transfer, but does not again enshrine sustainable development as an investment objective, which leads me once more to conclude that this concern is not meaningfully uh, translated to Kenya's foreign investment rules. Finally, um, is the right to regulate, uh, which, as I will uh, explain briefly, entails balancing standards of investor treatment. So transformative constitutions envision a state that is actively catalyzing social change. So some people have even referred to the transformative notion of a state as activist, as opposed to traditional liberal constitutions, which are more um, negative uh, in terms of the conduct of the state. So that, for example, includes affirmative action policies that I've stated prior, sustainable development, like formulating policies that meet the, the goals of poverty eradication and social welfare. So for example, for example, uh, in the Foresti case, South Africa, um, its transformative concerns with regard to racial equality due to the country's historically unequal nature by um, introducing minimum requirements for black ownership in mining companies. Uh, so they needed the regulatory capacity to do that, but ultimately um, it, they failed because of two standards of investor treatment. Uh, and those standards of investor treatment are also the standards of investor treatment I examine in Kenya's specific context. And the first of those is fair and equitable treatment. Um, so fair and equitable treatment uh, is defined quite vaguely in most agreements um, and has been interpreted differently in various investment tribunals, sometimes very broadly and sometimes very narrowly. Um, and in its broad in its broad sense, which which from one survey is is, is its most consistent form, um, things like even challenging the stability of, of the business framework, which is a very broad criteria, could be uh, taken as unfair and, 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 and equitable treatment. So fair and equitable treatment appears in all of Ken's agreements, but mostly in the broad and undefined manner that I have just described. For example, the Kenya UK BIT, the Kenya Germany BIT, the Kenya Swiss BIT. Uh, new agreements like the Kenya Japan and the Kenya Korea bilateral treaties are more specific in that they equate treatment accorded, they equate fair and equitable treatment to treatment according, uh, according to aliens under customary international law. But those are the exceptions. The large majority of them um, are, have, have fairly limited definitions. And the exceptions to fair and equitable treatment are fairly narrow as well. Um, very exceptionist to the sense of public. They are too narrow or too vague to open the floor for discussion or questions from the floor. And that's what I'm perhaps going to do. So thank you for your contribution. And that seeks to look at a translating transformative constitution to international investment law uh, 
with the case study of Kenya. Uh, I have perhaps one question, and this is again not to discard your question, your aspect of your paper, but perhaps so that we learn from you. The assumption, in my view, is that it's like almost everyone knows and understand the constitution of Kenya. When you are talking of transformative constitution in Kenya, perhaps we need to theorize a bit is transformative uh, how transformative because do you compare this to the previous constitution of Kenya because in the context of South Africa when we talk of transformative constitution constitutionalism we can we depart from the previous constitution existing inequality uh, echoed or but through the apartheid regime and when we talk of transformative constitution in South Africa where you see the right to equality at play, uh, the right, it, the, all the social economic rights uh, in the constitution, the Bill of Rights, that, uh, uh, that provide the enabling environment for the transformation of the society. And even there is criticized because uh, colleagues like uh, uh, Zaneli Sibanda will tell you that it's not even transformative because uh, it's, it's, it's a reflection of new liberalism agenda that cannot empower colleagues like Isaac Shai will say no, the constitution of the country speaks uh, does not speak to the people on the ground but it comes from Canada, America and the like so when you talk of transformative constitution in Kenya, of course you mention something about uh, the same in South Africa. We need to understand why you want to use the term transformative constitution uh, in the Kenyan context. That will help uh, the listeners or the reader to understand more. Uh, perhaps in that theoretical framework you should look also at what happened in South Africa. And in your terms, I did not hear any time, perhaps because you are presenting, you mentioning perhaps the father of the context, Karl Kla, who speaks about transformative constitution, constitution and, uh, since uh, 1998. So that to put the matter uh, in context to help the others, of course you will have a chance to respond to those questions. Uh, not to challenge your paper, which is a great paper, but we simply need to understand the, the basis of your argument, or else uh, colleagues like Magnus Tilanda will say you are making sweeping statements by calling this transformative constitutionalism. So, simply food for thought, uh, uh, and I use the example or the approach by the colleagues because he has saying that so many times even to me in some presentations and perhaps it was justified so just to so that you bear that in mind and yeah that's my main observation uh, that I will see clarity on and as we were talking to our colleagues before you I would like to have uh, for Takunda a question uh, that speaks and thank you for your previous responses which I found very comprehensive, both of you. But my question is to Takunda, who was talking of proactive actions by the government to ensure that a foreign transnational company, but the people. My question is, many, as you know, as being the expert in this, you know that some transnational companies are stronger than the state. The government cannot even dare being proactive against them. How then do we reconcile that challenge uh, with the proactive action? If a TNC, for instance, investing in the DRC is so powerful that the government cannot regulate against them, uh, how proactive can government action be? Please, 
if you have questions for Khalil or follow-up questions to colleagues in front, uh, I would like to give you the mic uh, because this is the last round because the, in their response, even if no, you don't have a question, you will have a minute to conclude, uh, to give your concluding observation. Any questions? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Prof. Um, thank you, Khalil, for a really interesting presentation. I think it links very well to Takunda's uh, presentation as well. There's a lot of similarities, even in talking about a proactive state and state action as well. So I think even the question that Prof asked Takunda, Khalil, <laughs> if you could also answer that one, that would be interesting to hear from you. Um, but I think my uh, question in light of both presentations is, does it seem like there's a bit of a legitimacy crisis in the international investment order? or regime, for lack of a better way of putting it. Because there seems to be a lot of uh, push or resistance from the Global South against a system that most people, most Global South did not have uh, an active role in creating. Um, and the resistance is causing perhaps the Global North or investors who want to in invest in the Global South to then sort of question how are they going to proceed to make investment or uh, FDI in the Global South going forward. And so for me, I, I think the, the best way to put it is really a legitimacy crisis where we're asking ourselves, why do we have the international investment regime that we have? Who does it benefit? Um, and then how do we go forward with allowing the Global South to be able to dictate better on their t own terms with regards to how international investment regime works. Um, and so, yeah, so maybe if both Khalil and Takundi can talk to just uh, what you perceive about the international investment regime going forward. All right. Thank you. Any other comments? Further? Thank you. Um, can you, uh, you, in your presentation, you, one of your su su suggestions is that uh, Kenya should look at South Africa to the um, black economic empowerment that was um, apparently successful there. But I would just um, want to point out uh, there, 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 were, there are many research, a lot of research that done. I, I, I checked one out here from Alvin Shava from uh, Northwest University who specifically says that the question is whether the black economic empowerment has benefited the black majority or not, or whether it is just, was this used to um, send the money to the already rich uh, people? So I just want to caution that, yes, it, 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 I think it was necessary black economic empowerment, but the implementation thereof should be very well monitored. That's just my observation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we don't have further questions. So Khalil, we we'll start with you. You can take three minutes. Then uh, we will give Takunda uh, three minutes and O'Brien uh, three minutes for final observations and remarks. Then we can conclude. Thank you, Khalil. Over to you. Thank you very much for the uh, great feedback. So regarding your first concern on the nature of this issue, nature of Kenya's constitution, I would, I would agree, would, does differ from the South African context. Um, there's still a transformation that is being sought. Uh, for example, with regard to the human rights point I've made, um, the previous constitution, which you asked me to speak about, was largely, um, it provided for human rights, but it it was infamous for clear backing uh, every human right in the, in the constitution. So the expansive human rights uh, regime currently existing uh, responds to that history. So to transform uh, Kenya towards a more towards a culture of justification, which I spoke about regarding socio-economic rights and and other economic principles of economic uh, provisions. That uh, um, so there's an author in Kenya. I don't know if people will know him here, but his name is Okofo Gando and. One of the, his greatest contributions is an article called Constitutions Without Constitutionalism. And he speaks of the fact that the political elite not only controlled uh, 
political in the country, but they use that political power to basically um, move resources, um, to centralize resources. Um, I believe it's that people, I'm not sure. So basically the material inequality of this uh, political elite post-colonialism um, is um, led to, to, you know, to, to great, great concentration of power and great concentration of resources in one place. Um, so the economic, those economic provisions I spoke about largely respond to that inequality that's always been there in Kenya's history. Um, regarding the, the criticisms of uh, Kenya's constitution, I have not looked into the liberalism uh, criticisms, but I will. What I can say is that uh, the Kenya's constitution, I believe like South Africa's constitution, was a consensus building exercise. So it took um, almost, I think, two decades, or, or, or at least close to two decades, to get to Kenya's constitution. And, and after um, that consensus building exercise, uh, a vote was put to the people to vote whether they wanted this constitution or whether they wanted the previous constitution. And clearly there are influences from other constitutions, but that uh, that exercise runs some form of legitimacy to the project of transformation, which I believe Kenyan's constitution envisions. But perhaps my view might change after I read up on the uh, various um, criticisms that you have mentioned. Uh, regarding the legitimacy crisis, I, um, it's a hard question. <laughs> uh, and I've, I, don't know, I, haven't, I don't have a super substantive answer to that question. What I can say is that um, I think it will take a, an amalgamation of efforts. Um, so there's this phenomenon of the reform of, of international investment law in Africa called the Africanization of international investment law. So countries in Africa have, have attempted to, to design or redesign investment rules according to their development priorities. But this is constantly undermined by, uh, you know, different, different African countries the, the history that um, African states, in the general, the global south, has been through with regard to investment. Uh, regarding the comments made by the final speaker, I do agree that the black economic empowerment had mixed results. Um, black economic empowerment, if anything, my, my focus was on showing how black economic empowerment was was um, was curtailed by uh, South Africa's previous previous investment treaties. My focus on South Africa specifically is to point towards uh, its reform process that, that led to the enactment of the Protection of Investment Act 2015 to realize its transformative aspirations. So I think Kenya could learn a lot from South Africa there, and particularly also because Kenya has borrowed a lot from South Africa's constitution, um, that the, the comparisons have always been made and um, the, the influences are very clear. And they're both African states that have, I think, that similar objective of um, designing for investment rules to suit their particular aspirations and, and context. Yeah, uh, I think with the time that I have, that's the answers. Those are the answers I can give at the moment. Uh, uh, thank, thank you, Prof. Um, I mean, I'll answer both questions. They they speak to one on the same thing. Um, with regards to your, your question, Prof, uh, the imbalances come in the instance of the private party and the, the government. I think that's a very good question, um, one that I not really thought of so much. But what I, I think perhaps what I would say is that uh, the biggest issue is when the government has to deal with a transnational company that has a global monopoly. Uh, in their instances where in certain in industries one company controls almost 80 percent deal with that but perhaps what they can try to do is to work in concert with the bigger economies uh, in
said ni tambasa netya we will start with frederick in this session because i do not have the bio summaries of the authors what i will do is to allow them two minutes to tell us a little bit about themselves and i think that saves us time because i know people are modest if you ask someone to introduce themselves they usually truncate core details but if you to ask me to introduce them i would have read their cvs from grade r what achievements they got there and went on with each grade until where they are now so i will ask every one of them when they come up to briefly take two minutes to tell us who they are what they're busy with what animates them what 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 is what these that they're presenting today um what is what is about so if um frederick hama frederick if, if frederick are with us please do indicate if you're online and you're logged in do indicate okay i'm not feeling any joy from frederick is um sydney with us online please do indicate if you're here sydney i i want to then i think in that case i should be able to uh, to present my presentation my slides uh, which requires that uh, part i've just listed part of the processes that are relevant to my presentation and uh, what, part of what the cabinet secretary in charge in this case of the ministry of industrialization which is the docket under which the epa fell under was required to submit uh, to the speaker of the national assembly the treaty itself as well as memorandum listing specific details of the treaty and you know some of these include um the the negotiation the national interests that may be affected by the ratification of the treaty as well as the views of the members of the public with respect to ratification but in the early processes when the cabinet secretary delivered this um uh, this uh, this treaty to the to the speaker of the national assembly some uh, the memorandum itself was missing uh, and it took a bit of confrontation from some of the stakeholders including uh, members of parliament themselves who had initially refused to consider this uh, at the floor uh, for this memorandum to be later added uh, and it did not come at the initial stage when the treaty was presented to the national assembly so uh, the, uh, the this uh, this process at the at the national assembly was protracted over a long period of time because of questions of public participation now at the time there was a major um, political uh, process in kenya uh, a, pro uh, a proposal to amend the constitution what we call the B uh, building bridges initiative which later on was defeated at the supreme court uh, it was the conversation the national conversation at the time and it took uh, you know, most of the social spaces, the news outlets, this was the conversation. Yet at the background, Kenya was pushing to ratify this EPA. So public participation was suppressed, and there was a case that went to court, which I featured in my paper. And uh, then this later came uh, came later when the process had far much advanced. Um, sorry, at the, yes, at the ESC level, we have Article 37 of the Customs Union Protocol, which gives a prerequisite and a four-tier process that Kenya was supposed to follow uh, before entering or ratifying this agreement. And uh, in my research, I did find that indeed Kenya can go without the EAC partner states to make, uh, to, you know, to, to enter into this agreement. However, it must follow the processes. So, of course, the prerequisite is that um, it must conform to the EAC as well as the Customs Union Protocol, uh, which they argue it did. And then the four-tier process, just as I conclude, is one that the state party, in, the partner state in this case, Kenya, had to send the proposed agreement to the Secretary General, who would then communicate to the other partner states for consideration within 30 days. And then um, upon receipt of the, no of the, of the notification, by the Secretary General, the other partner states were granted a 90-day window in which to comment and respond to the agreement. And then uh, thirdly, the, the, the Secretary General convened a meeting of the Council of Ministers to consider the comments and proposals within 60 days. And if this is not done, then Kenya would 
go on its own. Uh, uh, when when I try when I tried to investigate as to whether this process was adhered to, there seemed to be a lot of silences uh, within the official communications of the EAC, and therefore I relied on third party sources a lot. Um, hopefully, I can get more information as I uh, refine my paper. But it seemed that Kenya did not follow this procedure. It seemed, uh, based on the third-party reports, mostly uh, news outlets, that Kenya, uh, you know, overstepped this entire procedure and went on its own without considering the ESC. And uh, the final point I would make is that, uh, you know, by doing this, by overhauling the process that is required at the ESC level, then Kenya is directly uh, undermining, or so to say, uh, you know. Uh, not adhering to Article 26 of the Constitution, which requires it to, you know, to adhere to all the treaties and conventions it has ratified, in this case, including the ESC Treaty and the Customs Union Protocol. So then the UK-Kenya EPA becomes uh, a reversal to the development, or so to say, to the, to the progress of the regional economic community that is at the ESC level, and this in turn frustrates uh, in many ways, the the, the progress uh, towards the you know towards positioning the ESC as a building block to the FCFTA. So yes, uh, I suppose that my time is up, and I would like to thank you for that chance, and also to continue to stay on for further engagement. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Sydney. You, you just decolonized the concept, the fictitious concept of African time. You went over and above by 65 seconds. We thank you for that. I wanted to stop you, and then I realized you were close to finishing. So you just went over by 65 seconds. That's decoloniality at its best. Um, I, I, would, I would like to invite you to stay on. We'll take a round of questions once everyone has spoken, so to distribute the questions widely and allow speakers to gather the energy they need to respond to this vibrant audience that we have here. Right, thank you so much. Um, our next online speaker, I'm told he's in the house under a different login identity. Please, um, I will now give the floor to you to talk to us on your topic. Frederick, yes. Thank you so much. Can you hear me from that end? We can do this from five, go ahead. Thank you so much. As you have um, said, my name is Frederick Amadzeripe. I am a postdoc uh, research fellow at the Northwest University in South Africa. I'm going to present on a topic entitled an analysis of the legal implications of the African continental free trade areas rules of origin on economic integration and constitutionalism in, in Africa. The structure of the presentation shall be as follows. I'll start with an introduction, after which we'll look at um, intra-African trade and economic integration before the African continental free trade area. After that, we we'll look at a conceptual analysis of the rules of origin, which will be followed by the free trade areas rules of origin and related aspects. Thereafter, we we'll look at the implications of the African continental free trade areas rules of origin on economic integration and consumerism, which will be followed by concluding remarks. The African continental free trade area represents the world's largest free trade area after the WTO. One of the issues that could determine the success or achievement of um, the African continental free trade area's objectives is the nature and scope of the rules of origin. The reason is almost all goods that are subject to international trade are required by law to have a specific origin before declaration to relevant customs authorities at the port of entry of an importing country. 
rules of origin help customs authorities to determine the economic rather than the geographical origin of goods so in this presentation we are more focused on the economic um uh, origin rather than the, the geographical origin of goods that are subject of discussion there are, there are a lot of efforts which have been made to liberalize economic integration in africa by removing tariffs and non-tariff barriers to enhance economic uh, or the free movement of goods and services which include human capital intellectual property as seen by a lot of uh, regional economic communities or RECs that have been established in africa some of them include ECOWAS, COMESA, ECCAS, EIC, SADIG. However, the African continent of free trade area agreement could be the dawn of a new era to liberalize economic integration at continental level in Africa. The technicalities that surround the rules of origin could raise questions on the applicability and success of uh, the African continent of trade in Africa. It is therefore important that drafters of the AFTA agreement learn from the shortcomings of other African RICs, which are the building blocks of uh, of the African continent of trade area. We we'll now look at intra-African trade and economic integration before the promulgation of the African continent of free trade area. Before the African continent of free trade area, several RECs and bilateral trade agreements existed and continue to exist in Africa. These fragmented and heterogeneous RECs had different preferential trade concessions. There is some level of inconsistency or flexibility in the application of, of rules of origin by government as each country decides the criterion to apply in order to determine the national economic source of a product. The various RECs which applied um, and continue to apply, um, they have different criteria for determining the national origin of materials and products. For example, the Commissar and EAC determine the origin of goods through the change of um, tariff to classification, while it's um, the ECOWAS, it does not. We move on to look at a conceptual analysis of um, rules of origin. Rules of origin refer to the criteria or the body of laws and regulations that determine the economic nationality of certain goods. The importance of rules of origin can be seen in international trade since in most instances they determine the duties that are to be levied and the barriers imposed upon certain imports by the customs authorities of an importing country. For example, when a product is entirely produced in a certain country, it can be said that it originates from that country. However, this is not always the case in practice since most of the processed goods usually consist of several components or ingredients which may be imported from other countries which can either be a member of the african continental free trade area or not broadly speaking rules of origin can be divided into two web of origin when we're looking at non-preferential trade rules of origin these are the ones that um, the next category because of time on the other hand, we have preferential rules of origin, which refer to the criteria applied to determine whether goods qualify for duty to be levied or preferential terms offered under a trade agreement before they are imported. The criteria for preferential trade rules of trade can be categorized into two main origin criteria, namely product specific rules of origin and regime wide rules of origin. Product specific rules of origin can be subcategorized into wholly obtained goods and the substantial transformation of goods criterion. For example, 
life animals born in the bureaucracy could frustrate the achievement of uh, the African continent of determine the exporting company's choice of raw materials. An exporter will require preferential status when the benefits of market access exceed the compliance costs. The compliance costs uh, that you are talking about here are those that are related to the acquiring of um, the certificate of origin. Is um, the variation of interest between developing and least developed countries in Africa. For example, developing countries and big economies like Nigeria and South Africa may require the criteria for rules of origin to be drafted in a way that may be unfavorable to least developing countries. There could also be concerned that relaxed rules of origin could lead to trade deflection. However, least developed countries may favor relaxed rules of origin in order to promote foreign direct investment rules of origin on economic integration and custom could harmonize africa's fragmented markets and significantly increase production by reducing business operational costs this could be done by promoting economic integration in africa uh, through increasing market efficiency and enhancing economies of scale these opportunities could all depend on the criteria adopted for the determination of the economic nationality of goods. Two flexible rules of origin could enhance investment, but at the same time may cause trade deflection. On the other hand, a strict up approach to the determination of rules of origin could promote domestic production of intermediate inputs. As a result, countries like Nigeria, South Africa, and Egypt could consider stricter rules of origin, while its least developed countries may be in favor of liberal liberal rules of origin despite being elusive the term personalism uh, incorporates tenets such as democracy the protection of human rights and judicial independence in a constitutional state the distribution of power between government's main organs namely the legislature the executive and the judiciary is closely set out in a constitution which provides certainty of law and uh, enhance investor confidence. A country's constitution plays a, a significant role in advancing social and uh, societal oppression and past injustices by defining property and land rights and by defining social and economic rights as well. The success of the African continental free trade area could be challenged by contemporary national security and political issues in Africa's two biggest economies that is nigeria and south africa tax in nigeria which have been largely blamed on foreign terrorists who take advantage of uh, nigeria's uh, porous borders could frustrate the movement of goods and people in and out of goods and people in and out of nigeria on the other hand persistent xenophobic attacks on foreigners and foreign owned businesses and, and properties could threaten nigeria and south africa could affect the ultimate success of uh, the african economies are not only the biggest, only the but, biggest they but they are also major links to europe and other countries, and other countries outside, outside south africa, africa. Uh, sorry, outside, outside africa. africa south africa and nigeria's ports of entry are some of the busiest ports on the continent trade liberalization and economic integration in the light of the possible challenges which have been highlighted um above the after rules of origin might pose to the I achievement of, of the set of objectives a few recommendations are offered here the first one it is recommended that after adopts self-certification regarding the exporters acquiring certificates of origin this could neutralize the possibility or the possible bureaucracy that could result from the current procedure self-certification could also minimize delays that could discourage exporters and the recommendation um, concerning the rest of africa respectively it is suggested uh, that a cautious approach be adopted by all signatories to the action we will now move on to consult my program to see the introduction Cooperatives have been recognized by the United Nations Development Program as integral to the development of Nigeria. The contributions of cooperatives to development started in the pre-colonial era 
and it has lasted through the colonial and to till date it is still very relevant to the socioeconomic development in Nigeria. Yeah, during the colonial era, they were particularly integral. Well, traditional cooperatives provided the foundation for the cottage industry, which were integral to the very first set of attempts by indigenous Nigerian societies to make um, very good contributions, particularly in the western region. However, the optimized problem statement inability of nigerian cooperatives to mag to optimize their potentials and in contrast to the momentum the cooperative movement gathered during the pre-colonial era and their exploits particularly all right yeah era when the cooperatives mm -hmm. Ude versus federal republic of nigeria and others federal court abuja civil case 1185 2022 Okay, let me just go on with this. The Federal High Court in Abuja basically told a Nigerian citizen, Mr. Okomaye Ude, that he has no case against the NYC Act, which is one of the legislations listed under sub, um, Section 315 of the 1999 Constitution. That, look, this law is unchallengeable by virtue of the constitutional provision. Now, if we look at item 32 of the exclusive, okay, the integration into the constitution is in, in itself has been canvassed here, is not in itself holistic to promote the Nigerian cooperative law. Rather, it brings to the fore questions as to the current constitutional provisions on cooperatives on the one hand and substance of the cooperative legislation that is proposed for integration into the constitution on the other the latter has earlier been answered now moving forward item 32 of the exclusive legislative list 19 of the 1999 constitution appears to vest powers to make cooperative law on the state houses of assembly however the Nigerian Co Cooperative Societies Act, SOPRA, in its preamble states, an act to provide for the registration and operation of cooperative societies throughout the Federation and for related matter. Furthermore, Section 1, Subsection 2 of the Nigerian Cooperative Societies Act, SOPRA, gives powers to the state governors to appoint state directors of cooperative and give assistance with all auxiliary powers. Given the provisions of Section 4, subsection 5 of the 1999 Constitution, which basically says that when a state laws in Nigeria, we have the federal and 36 components unit, which basically says that if any law of any of these component states goes against a federal enactment, that particular provision of the law that goes against the federal enactment becomes null and void to the extent of its inconsistent. Now, if Item 36 of the exclusive legislative list of the 1999 Constitution, Section 4, Subsection 5 of the 1999 Constitution, Preamble to the Ni Nigerian Cooperative Societies Act, and Section 1, Subsection 2 of the Nigerian Cooperative Societies Act are read together. Then the National Assembly reserves the sole powers in Nigeria to review and amend cooperative laws in Nigeria and integrate the same into the constitution now this basically presents a conclusion of the whole project because the cooperative law in nigeria is not well situated is not appropriate it cannot uh, support sustainable development and the national assembly has the power to review amend and integrate same into the constitution as seen with other laws that have been mentioned Earlier. A comprehensive review and amendment of Nigerian Cooperative Societies Act by the National Assembly with due consideration for co customary cooperative philosophies in strict accordance with the statement on cooperative identity of the International Cooperative Alliance and recommendations on cooperative development by the International Labour Organization. The integration of the amended law 
into the 1999 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria as amended. Thank you very much. Ajibola, you went over and above with three minutes to spare. <laughs> over and above. Uh, no, not, not that you exceeded, oh, but in I your attempt to decolonize that's right. Thank you, sir. African time, you exceeded everyone else. So, yeah, thank you for, for that. You've, give us, you've given us enough time now to distribute to the other colleagues, Diana Nkata and uh, Wayne Mutuma. Wayne is joining us um, over the, the, the networks, but a colleague is here to present to us on their paper. Your, the floor is yours. I think I would have preferred if we went over a bit, but <laughs> <laughs> so um, as you've heard, my name is Diana Nkatha. I work, or rather, I'm here courtesy of University of Nairobi. Um, I have a master's in international rela international trade and challenges that will come from those gaps and the possible opportunities of addressing the said gaps. Um, so uh, in my paper, uh, we looked at uh, the a comparative uh, study, or rather we drew lessons from the EU, as well as the Association of Southeast Asian Nations uh, Economic Community. This is because uh, the, some of the integrated markets that have existed over time. And um, the following are the gaps that I identified in AFCFTA agreement that is causing the uh, challenges that people are facing in the implementation, the legal challenges. Uh, the first one is that when we look at the agreement, uh, it is not quite clear on the from the onset, uh, from the onset, there is no, there's a confusing legal aspect on what AFCFTA is and what the AU is. Uh, I once attended a conference in Uganda on AFCFTA implementation, and people tend to believe that a AFCFTA is a whole other entity instead of just it being a project, uh, being implemented as a AU um, a part of AU's mandate. Uh, because of that, many people are resisting because you know how African countries are. They resist uh, new things, especially when they are coming to interfere with their municipal laws. So that is one of the big, big, biggest challenges attributed to the instrument. The second one is that uh, the instrument is largely uh, Western in nature. You will realize that it, uh, it's, it addresses African countries as if we are, uh, we, are we don't have, we, okay, we have different colonizers, we have different uh, cultures, we have different tra traditional uh, practices and beliefs. So um, you will notice that in most of these forums, you will miss people from Francophone countries, people who speak, speak Portuguese, right, like the Mozambique. I've not seen any in all the conferences that I've attended. So of course, there's this clear uh, line that has been drawn in the, from the agreement itself. Um, there's also an issue on the lack of safeguards uh, that are there to protect the independence of AFCFT implementation. As you have noticed, we are having challenges with municipal laws, so which means that every country has already, uh, like, they tend to shelter themselves. What if uh, implementation of AFCA takes off? Uh, what will happen if uh, dictatorial dic uh, leaderships are against the implementation? How do we safeguard uh, the, you know, the rights of another country that you are participating in trade with? So there are no that those kinds of safeguards in the agreement. Uh, in addition to that, uh, it was mentioned yesterday, one of the lacking uh, aspects of uh, the instrument is that there are no provisions uh, for human rights, which means that AFCFTA was to take over today, and Africans are, uh, of course, very interested in propagating it, or rather, uh, successfully implementing it. They'll end up looking for any means of winning, because that is what we do as Africans. We compete against each other instead of working with each other. So that would mean people, uh, there would be issues of child labor and any other kind of uh, human rights infringement. Without that kind of protection in the agreement, there is no way we can implement uh, without it coming up as an issue. Another uh, aspect that there is a gap in the agreement is there is no protection or a, a provision uh, towards force majeure uh, um, occurrences. That is why we realized the agreement was to be implemented as from 2020, and then they had to postpone it for a whole year. That tells you already that's a very big gap. They should have found a way to commence with the implementation process. What if AFCFTA today becomes a very interactive and cement policies in their own uh, protection for intellectual property? Because, of course, it's not understand the intellectual uh, needs of a country like South Africa, you see. So it's up to you as a country, as a South Africa, to come up with intellectual protection for your own, and then Kenya can come with us, and then we can have a, find a way to find a mutual uh, ground to work in. Another important aspect is that there is need for serious sensitization, training, awareness on AFCFTA because uh, I work in, I'm a lawyer, I work in 
corporate law and I can tell you like 90% of my friends who are lawyers have no idea what FCFTA is. I only know it by virtue of working in international trade. How is the rest of the country supposed to do it? So we need to, uh, to purpose on um, sensitizing and trade uh, private international law courts because that is how we are able to uh, address issues um, in this kind of nature under FCFTA. Uh, lastly, it, it would be very encouraged for, there are so many countries that have not ratified so many of the agreements that will be used in implementing of AFCFTA, and uh, it would be encouraged that that kind of initiative is uh, taken at this ground level. So yeah, that was basically it for my paper, and I am so happy to be done with it. Thank you very much. You and uh, Jibola actually had three minutes left when you finished. We, we have listened to these insightful presentations here from Sydney, who talked about transformation, constitutionalism, and AFCA. He talked about, he traced the evolution of this field in Africa, which I like very much because it goes, you know, back to the beginning, um, which is what we need to do in decolonial scholarship, go back to the basics. It's the only way we can all topple Eurocentrism. He talks about the two approaches, RSC-centric and uh, state-centric um, uh, approaches. And then he talks about national values um, that uh, I think the, the Constitution of Kenya talks about and how that is not embedded into... How much? 30 minutes. Okay, that gives enough time to, to deal with questions. Um, but yeah, Sydney talks about national values and I'm, gon I'm going to take advantage of this time while I'm summarizing his, his presentation to pose a question to him. Because um, South Africa also has values in its constitution. And this is a question I, I wanted to, to pose to Mumalo earlier on, but uh, uh, he was lucky we ran out of time. Um, the question is, um, since USAID values are, are, are largely ignored when, this when these frameworks are now being um, negotiated, um, what, what, what is the cause of Africa or the African Union or African states ignoring African values when it comes to developing legal frameworks of their own. I, I talk a lot about the AU failing to embrace African values uh, in its framework, but running with concepts such as transformative constitutionalism, running with concepts such as equality, freedom, human freedom, uh, human dignity, but not expanding or incorporating African values into the legal framework. What, what, what is the cause of that? The example of South Africa here is illustrative. In the interim constitution, we had Ubuntu as a value. When the final constitution came, Ubuntu was nowhere to be seen in the values that are, that are listed in the constitution. We only have it today by virtue of precedent because of S versus Makwanyana. It now lives in the South African context. It, it, it's, it's like a pandemic across Africa that African values don't make it into the legal framework. Perhaps you could share um, some light onto that. But that's just my question. You combine it with the questions that will come from the, fr from the floor. Frederick, you talked about the conceptual analysis and you unpacked it very nicely as well. You, you, you laid out the concepts. You pointed out the tensions between you know, free trade and national security, between um, uh, uh, sovereignty and what we are trying to do as a continent. I think y your paper did a lot to, 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 to lay the foundation for these two speakers who came after you as well. Um, so thank you for, 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 for laying out those, the, the, those concepts. Um, Ajibola, you went into constitutionalism as an imperative. And um, what I liked about your paper was how that what Europe will claim was given to us through Christianization and colonial, colonialism actually was not given to us. We just called it differently, but we practiced it before they actually came to Africa to colonize us. Those things were there. Cooperatives were not given to us. We exi they existed before we were colonized. In fact, it's colonialism that messed them up and, and changed their shape and made them not, no longer that much useful for our society. So I think your paper in that regard and the fact that it went into MIT as well, multi intertransdisciplinarity, uh, takes away from the, 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 the paucity of legal um, uh, research where the lawyer thinks he can solve the world's problems using legal problems, which I, again is, is, is an element of coloniality where the law must answer all questions, which is absolute nonsense. But your paper takes us out of the area of uh, multidisciplinarity, where we draw from various disciplines to answer real life um, uh, problems in society. Um, Diana, yours and Dr. Mutuma's paper also touched on the gaps and challenges 
and you 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 some of the issues that were canvassed before you touched on them as well such as sovereignty um, which you have observed to what Africa is trying to do um, and you you raised several uh, interventions that could be adopted by the African Union in order to to, to try and make this um, a meaningful intervention for Africa so we'll now open the floor um, for, for, for questions. We'll take three rounds of questions at a time. They will answer, and then we'll go back again for another round of questions. I not you, Prof, and I not you, the lady over there, and the third hand, nothing from the online community. I don't see anything there. So we have two questions. Right, please give them the roving mic. Hello. Okay. Um, Dr. Toby from University of Pretoria. Um, I love the presentations of the four uh, presenters, but I have two questions for a question for Dr. Frederick and uh, Diana, then one for Ajibola. My question in the EFCT, both of you talk about uh, fear. Frederick talked about cautious approach. Now, how do we, as Africans, approach the legalizations and the instrumentations of the law in these trade zones if we are to be cautious and we are afraid of the things EFCT will bring? And uh, you talk about the WTO practices we should try to imbibe into that aspect. How do we bring into the legal framework for the EFCTA? Bearing in mind the borderless Africa, as Dr. Frederick puts it. Now that is my question for both of you, Frederick and Diana. Now, Ajibola, your, your presentation was very nice, but I have some few areas to discuss issues. Your presentation was talking about cooperative, and you basically base it on Western Nigeria. You didn't move into the northern part of the country where you have the granite cooperative, or the eastern part where they have the palm oil cooperative. My question now comes in, all the amendments and all the constitutionalism that you have seen from the Constitution, how does it affect these other areas in Nigeria? within the cooperative sector and the laws and the amendments. Because I, I would rather would say your paper should be talking about Western Nigeria. Instead of talking about the Nigeria of who you're supposed to have gone through these facets so that you bring in these areas, these regions that are apart from your region and see how those cooperatives could work. How will you have done that? It's not a question anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a consign, but try to elaborate more if you were to bring in all those factors from other areas in your country. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the panelists for great presentations. I just have two questions, one for Frederick and then one for uh, Diana as well. Um, I guess with Frederick, um, one of the points that struck me in your presentation is when you were discussing the constitutionalism related concerns about the rules of origin and specifically concerns around usurping sovereignty and what this means for respect for domestic processes, etc. That struck me because in some ways the entire free trade area agreement seems to be a giant project specifically in breaking down ideas of sovereignty. I mean, I think in creating a free trade agreement, one of the implications is that you are going to you know, break down borders, make them more porous. There is some sense of supranational structures that are going to take over to regulate trade. Um, so I guess my specific question for you is, is it really a problem of constitutionalism if in fact sovereigns have decided and have gone through domestic processes to ratify the free trade agreement, have signed up to this? Um, is it a problem of constitutionalism if in fact this has been voluntarily done, it's, it's not being foisted on any country, but rather they have gone through constitutionally uh, validated processes to adopt the free trade area agreement and with it um, the requirements that it entails around, you know, opening borders, opening markets, etc. 
Um, and then my question for Diana, sort of in two parts, I think um, there's a really interesting explanation of some of the gaps and issues that we're seeing with the agreement that will have, you know, obvious significant uh, implications for implementation. My first question is that when I think of something that you said, like say the absence of operational manuals or rules in the agreement, there's a school of thought that might say actually don't put that level of detail or that sort of issue in the agreement. Keep it outside to allow you know, flexibility, greater consultation, sort of a more drawn up process to develop those kinds of granular aspects um, of the agreement. So how much of these gaps are a feature and how much are actually a bug? And then sort of secondly, um, some of the other gaps you highlighted are actually a lot more concerning and substantive. And I'm curious if you have any insight into why the agreement was drafted in a way that leaves these gaps. Was so this much for that um, uh, observation? Yeah, I agree with you that cooperatives were not only strong in the western part of Nigeria; they were also strong in the eastern and in the northern parts. Yeah. Part of my studies on cooperatives in the eastern part uh, was based on the August meeting, something called August meeting, whereby um, people in the eastern part come around to basically help each other. And within this, I also realized, based on um, oral narrative from very elderly people from that part of the country, that the idea of learning trade, whereby a young fellow lives home with practically nothing, is attached to a master who trains him in the out of, out of business for like five, ten years, thereafter settles him, um, give him some basic fund for businesses, is in itself a form of community building of young men, and it has elements of cooperatives too. Now, the good thing is, in virtually all parts of Nigeria, you find successful models of cooperatives. However, you agree with me that the studies around those things are so extensive. By every classification, I'm tagged as an early career. So I have um, identified my area as my primary research locally. I understand what goes on in other areas of Nigeria to basic or further than basic extent. However, my extensive knowledge is in what has gone around my, uh, the western parts of the country. I wouldn't like to double into an area, at, at least for the purpose of my paper presentation and publication, into areas where I cannot assert my authority, and I think it's also in Nigeria, and I, you, will, you will agree with me that when you're talking about cultures, if you are not from this particular culture, you don't reside there, it's very difficult to present authoritative works on them. You can only touch them in your works. That doesn't defeat, that doesn't take anything away from these cultures. My reference the work is built on the cooperative law in Nigeria as a whole. And I have identified the deficiencies in the Nigerian cooperative law. And I have preferred constitutionalism as remedy for the identified deficiency. I've only included the, West, the, the, the cooperative and the cooperative law of the western parts of the country as my by one of the variables of the work. Can I just rest it like that? Yeah, thank you. OK. Um, uh, the two questions, uh, the first one, how do we approach co uh, AFCFT cautiously? Because of the aspect of uh, fear and, yeah. So um, I think um, in most countries being uh, a self-effort kind of initiative. The, the self-effort kind of initiative is taking place because I have noticed with AFCFTA there are some countries which have not even started to deal with the issue of the fear and the uncertainty surrounding it. For example, in Kenya, I know for a fact that we have come up with various programs uh, that are, are trying to reach out to people and uh, entrepreneurs, business-minded people, uh, the youth, women. Uh, we have various programs. Actually, part of three of the programs, the Africa Youth Entrepreneurship 
inter entrepreneurship program, Af AFCFTA climate change activists. Uh, so it's up to, I think, every country to come up with ways to reach out to their own people so they can understand the FCFT from the ground level and then now it can easily flow in uh, across the, the countries, I think. Also, we are including it in curriculums. Uh, in our school of law, I understand uh, that, uh, not UN, uh, there are some school of laws that have tried to bring it up uh, in, under the aspect of trade. So it's, uh, it's going to be a very slow process. I think if we rush it, of course, uh, Africans will retaliate. Uh, we don't like new things, so I think uh, that is the best approach. Um, on the issue of how your question, uh, when I was talking about the operations manual, you know, I do a lot of uh, policy f uh, formulation and I draft legal uh, documents. And in most cases, of course, you don't include the, uh, these practical administrative issues in the document. All I say is that in, in that agreement, they could have put like uh, something like the guidelines on how to operationalize this would be provided. They're always provided. Uh, like, for example, if you come up with uh, how inspections will be, how they should be done, it's just a way of guiding so that we can have a similar goal and a similar outcome. But if there is no similar goal, or sim I mean, similar process towards achieving a similar goal, everyone will come and approach it from their own um, understanding. And also, on the issue of gaps, I do understand that uh, there was, of course, the aspect of it being a blind spot because it's a new issue and not everyone. Uh, and also, there was also the issue of... Uh, allowing flexibility. I believe there will be various amendments in the course of implementation, which will just be like an extra to the actual agreement. Yeah. Ah, thank you. Um, thanks, colleagues, for that response. Um, Sydney, you will have the floor now and perhaps respond to some of the questions that were raised and directed to you. Thank you. I, if I'm not uh, grievously interested, the question for African values in our traditions. Uh, and I am We are losing you somehow, Sydney. I, I think your connection may not be that stable. Sorry, can can you hear me? Now I can hear you. Go ahead. You can press it, Sydney. Okay, thank you. Uh, apologies for that. I, I I I had mentioned that I'm not sure in the case of South Africa why that is the case, uh, but I just wanted to highlight. Um, the Article 10 of our uh, Kenyan Constitution of 2010. I look at the, the, the South the article that the, the extensive values of how you know traditional Africa operated, and I think some of these values are actually uh, a good value is that you can call African values, for instance, a national unity, for instance, the partisanalized, and so forth and so forth. And and, and to me, uh, I think uh, I claim them as, you know, even though they may not uh, traditionally sound like that, but they could be. And, and maybe just finally, uh, we understand that uh, the constitution, like, you know, it is true for Kenya as is any other African country, is a compromise of uh, multiple negotiations. So you would find perhaps that the negotiations leading to, you know, to the finalization of what makes it into the constitution uh, have, you know, some things have to be cut, for instance, some things have to be uh, compromised. Uh, but, but my conclusion would be, I think these values are feature highly when I look at the at, at, at the at Article 10. Why the political class doesn't adhere to them? I think uh, this would be in the case where these values maybe slow down their processes. A lot of times, it's uh, you know uh, many times. I wouldn't say a lot of times, but I could say sometimes uh, when these values come in the way of you know achieving 
doing something very fast, for instance, participation of the people, you would find that the political class just ignores this and goes ahead without that, or, you know, does a sham process, so to say, or a half-baked process, although this is usually defeated in court uh, every time it comes up. Yeah, thank you for that. Thanks, Sydney. We can take another round of questions if there are any pending questions from the floor or from the online community. Going once. Going. Yes. <laughs> you can go ahead, Doc. I say come back to Diana and uh, Frederick. I'm so much interested in the, when you talk about relying on existing laws of trading and you talk about sensitization. Sensitization, let us allow the existing laws and... Uh, I don't know if I can answer that question. I will be misleading. Uh, because I don't know how exactly we can incorporate the African culture um, values unless if it's still done from the country level. I don't think at any point it is possible to accommodate all the African values, which in most cases are different in each country. The, av the values that um, are in Kenya, for example, I have noticed are very dissimilar to those in Tanzania. They, I don't know what you refer to as African values, though. If they're talking about Ubuntu, cohesion, and all that, then that's similar. But I, I don't know how I can address, unless, of course, our chair over here can assist. <laughs> Diana is putting me on the spot. I'm not going to answer, Diana. I, I see what you're doing there. Um, but when it comes to African values, the AU is always hammering on the need to solve African problems using African solutions. But when it has the opportunity to do so, it goes for Western concepts. It does not throw from African concepts. African values are the first part of call the AU should be going to, to figure out pre-colonial Africa. What did we hold in high esteem? What did we place value on? What, 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 what is it that we can throw from that particular period into the contemporary period in order to advance Africa? So the ball lies with the AU. The values may look different. Like Ubuntu, for instance. We now call it Ubuntu, but if I go to Nigeria, it has a name. If I go to Kenya, it has a name. But you all understand, if I say Ubuntu, we all understand what it means. These values may have different identities, or different names, but they are the same. Essentially, it is the content of the value we're interested in. But the AU is turning us down. You know, it's, 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 let, it's letting us down by not incorporating these values into the legal frameworks. It is quick to to, to, to actually rely on um, what were given as universal values by the Global North. Because the Global North's dominance um, takes Global North values and present them as universal values. But why are we not able to take African values and present them as universal values as well, as Africans? So we are shooting ourselves in the foot in that regard. Yeah. Thank you very much, Prof. Like uh, my learning senior raised the issue that uh, I touched only the Yoruba speaking part of Nigeria. Now the fact is, the, 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 the perspective is coming from is that every community in Nigeria, every ethnic, every tribe has a, a response, a social solidarity response to socioeconomic challenges and even to political challenges. Cooperatives are available in all, uh, within all societies in Nigeria, but they have their different peculiarities. However, within these peculiarities, they have been able to excel during the pre-colonial era. There were different responses, and many of these responses were, by every standard, uh, successful. Now, one of the things I raised in my paper is that Originally, industrialization in Nigeria was initially built around traditional cooperatives. As of that time, there was nothing like the colonial government. The moment the colonial government saw, observed that, look, 
these cooperative societies, these traditional cooperative societies, have the capacity to build an economy that is different from what the colonial masters want, then they brought the Nigerian Cooperative Ordinance of 1935, which was more or less a, a, a mechanism to cake them. Now, the scanting part is that the same attitude of the colonialists were sustained by Nigerians, the Nigerian elite class, in the post-colonial era. You see, we, see, we have a situation whereby government back home is not patronizing what is traditional to us. I'm not advocating that we should go back to the traditional in the strict sense. However, the traditional models of cooperatives offers a foundation, a background that can be developed and thereafter are brought together with what we can import, like what the Chinese have done, what the Indians have done. They build the Luca and they borrow from the imported variant, which gives a unique model that identifies, that reconciles both what is theirs and what needs to be borrowed. Thank you. That, that was a good summary um, of what decoloniality is and um, how we should see it you know, at work um, in, in all the solutions that we're proposing for the African continent. Colleagues, we have come to um, the end of our session. I thank the speakers, both those who are physically here and those who joined us online. And I thank the audience for being well behaved. Um, for that good behavior, we'll now uh, disengage and go to lunch as a token of our appreciation for the good behavior. Thank you very much. Uh, just an uh, announcement. We'll break now for lunch. We are running behind schedule, so we were asked to please uh, have lunch for one hour. So that would mean uh, quarter past two we should resume with the afternoon sessions. And then also if there's anyone here who needs uh, to undergo cover tests for immigration purposes or something of that effect, please let one of us know so that we see if we can assist in uh, facilitating that process. Recording in progress.